this is a distinguished panel that I've been asked to moderate. And if I went into the introductions, I think it's going to use up a chunk of the time. So I'm not going to introduce them. I'm just going to share a little bit of what I know about them. Um, I'm going to start maybe from the far right. Henrik, I mean, he travels the lightest. I don't know how. He was in like Bangalore with me two days, three days ago, and he had a backpack. <laughs> um, on the other hand, Mia. <laughs> um, I mean, we went for a four-day trip just within this country, and there were like multiple bags that had to be carted around. <laughs> um, Rhoda, uh, I guess, in addition to Alzheimer's and neuropsych, her passion is the Olympics and the bucket list of things she wants to do. Yeah. I'm told the Super Bowl is on her bucket list. Yeah. Um, I guess, Jeff, the words are rock star, right? Like that paper that you put out, everybody reads that paper. <laughs> like it's like we're waiting for that publication to come out. Um, I, I look forward to getting to know you a little bit better so I can find out how many bags you travel with, etc. <laughs> <laughs> and then my good friend Howard here, uh, Mark already talked about our journey. Um, I was worried that the call that I was on with Howard and Mark was going to be the shortest call of my life because we were about to talk about biomarkers, uh, diagnostics for Alzheimer's. This is 2017, I believe, and Howard goes, we don't work on amyloid. We don't work on those types of things. I'm like, uh, okay, how do I restart this conversation now? I'm so glad we did. Um, Howard, you've been a great friend, and this Diagnostics Accelerator program of ours is, as I think Henrik is who I'm going to say, that we made a big difference to the field, and it's large credit to you, uh, Mark, and the Louder family. Uh, with that, that was the introduction to the esteemed panel. I think you all know their bios, but I'm going to turn to them and ask them a question. Share one thing that most people don't know about you. So um, ah. I'll maybe give you 30 seconds to think it through. Um, in the meantime, let me introduce the topic of our panel today. It's the future of biomarkers and precision medicine in Alzheimer's disease and expand it. Let's go to related dementias. So I'm going to break it into the future of biomarkers and the future of precision medicine. Of course, we can make the Venn diagram interact and come together. I think I bought you enough seconds to think yeah. about what is the one thing that many people in this audience may not know about you. And who wants to go first? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know everything I'll, I'll already. Go. So <laughs> go ahead, Rhoda. All right. So... Um, when I started my career, I guess, in research, I learned how to train pigeons because I worked in VF Skinner's lab. And so, so consequently, um, when I was in college, you know, this was when I was in college, and I saw an injured pigeon near my dorm, and I knew how to catch it. And I caught it, and I rehabilitated it. <laughs> and released wow. it. I never knew that. <laughs> See, there we go. <laughs> All right. I'm pigeons too. All right, Mia. I, yeah, and it's also a bit my career. I have always wanted to work with Alzheimer's. This has been my kind of dream. And we talked about this during the lunch break because I was sitting next to Lars Lanfeld. Lars, are you still here? I can't see. Anyway, so I came to Sweden as an exchange student, and Lars is working with um, genetics, of course, and, and uh, of course, amyloid. So the idea was that I would work with Lars. I needed to go back to Finland because I needed to, uh, to uh, or finish my, my kind of medical education. Then when I came back to Sweden, Lars had gone and moved to Uppsala. So we were joking that I needed to select lifestyle because Lars had took the amyloid and he had left. So I'm kind of happy because lifestyle interventions is kind of the missing piece. And now we are planning the combination <laughs> therapies and we are here. Wonderful. Howard or Jeff? I'll, I'll jump in. So... Um, uh, I have a somewhat unusual background in that I grew up in, a, in very rural northern Wyoming. 
uh, and uh, there are actually quite few neuroscientists uh, from uh, northern Wyoming. Uh, there were 25 people in my graduating class. Uh, there were 1,300 people in my hometown, which is just slightly smaller than the number of beds in the hospital when I got to Los Angeles. Uh, so uh, I was coming from wow. a very rural background into uh, a much more sophisticated uh, oh. setting and uh, I've done okay uh, <laughs> but uh, I had uh, I had a very different kind of raising sure. yeah I'd say serendipity played a big part in my life when I was in high school in 1965 which was probably before a lot of the people in the audience were even born I um, I was asked to do a research paper on a, on a molecule I had never heard of called acetylcholine so it turns out that um, my career started, it became the first drug, obviously, the drug target for Alzheimer's disease. And then I went to college in the late 60s, and I was pretty much a hippie, basically. Um, but what saved my life was neuroscience again, because I was in a neurobiology program uh, that was run by a guy named uh, Martin Seligman, who was the f author, sort of, of uh, a theory of depression called learned helplessness. And I got to work in his dog lab while everybody was protesting the Vietnam War and saved my my life then, and then uh, in med school, I did. Uh, I got into involved in a neurosurgical group that was doing research on something called the Kluver Busey syndrome, where we were aspirating the am the amyloid. Uh, I mean the. Um, oh God, the uh, <laughs> blocking on the name. <laughs> The, anyway, forget it. So, and um, published my first neuroscience paper in 1971, oh, wow. which was a long time ago, and then did an internship and residency. And uh, during the residency, I was probably the only person in the, resin, in the internal medicine residency that had uh, any background in research. And we were at lunch, and somebody on the on the um, board of the hospital I was at had given Rockefeller University a million dollars to revamp their clinical trials unit, which was the first clinical research center in the United States. And in return for that, one of the residents in our group could go to Rockefeller for three months to do an elective. And she, the, res, the chief of medicine asked if anybody wanted to go, and I raised my hand because everybody else wanted to go into practice and, you know, just do it. I get up there, and it turns out that I was in the lab of Macklin McCarty, who was a, a part of the paper, Avery, McLeod, and McCarty, who in 1944 proved that DNA was the genetic material of life. And instead of three months, I ended up staying there 12 years sure. and, uh, and started the Alzheimer's Clinic there in 1981. So that's kind of how I, my, that's kind of my origin story of how I got into the field. I've been doing this a long time. Well, thank you for sharing that. And uh, I keep telling myself I'm going to have a 30-second question for Howard, and I'm going to make him stick to the end. <laughs> <laughs> and to date, I have failed. But today, I'm convinced. I'm going to try again. All right. Yo, um, I hesitate. I saw you took notes here. I have a criminal record uh, for, for crime against the Swedish fishing law. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, my, my, yeah, I have to explain myself a little bit now. So I fish for crabs, and they have escape holes for small crabs. And the diameter of my escape holes were 1.5 centimeters too narrow. Um, I started by blaming my kids, but then <laughs> when I was interviewed by the sea police, but um, then I actually took the um, punishment. It's not a felony. <laughs> it's uh, just a crime. It's so, no problem for me traveling so to any part of the, the world except Canada. When you enter different countries, <laughs> when they ask you to fill out that form, you read it carefully, whether it's a crime or a felony, whether to check the box or not. <laughs> so I, I, I write no and hope no one cross-references the records. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit of a slippery slope, I realize that. So, so, uh, uh, so in India, our recommendation was that he just seek pardon when he received <laughs> the prize and meets the queen here. The queen has left. <laughs> no. Of course I should have done that. <laughs> All right. So you know the panel now better than you did before we started. Um, biomarkers. So on the, on the way here, I was looking up, what is a biomarker? 
and I got a very detailed FDA definition uh, that it has to be a biological um, analyte, either somewhere in the tissue, the cells, so it could be in the circulating fluid, it could be a protein, it could be a gene, it could be a transcript, et cetera, et cetera. And then I asked the question, what are the types of biomarkers? And then I got this big criteria, it's the BEST, B-E-S-D is the acronym, I don't know what it stands for, but it's an FDA defined thing and they have seven different types to which you can apply biomarkers all the way from diagnosis to risk prediction to monitoring to safety, et cetera, et cetera. So rather than me read that page, I figured I would just start with that question and ask Howard to begin with, what context of use come to mind when you think about biomarkers? Well, there's, there's about seven of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, there's a predictive, um, there's um, diagnostic, there's monitoring of treatment, um, there's um, pharmacodynamic type of biomarker. That's, I guess, four out of seven. Or probably Jeff knows the other three. <laughs> so those, those are the ones I think of. It, what are you most excited about? Which one do you feel like the field, uh, particularly where we are, should pay more attention to, closer attention to? Well, I think there's, there's two things where we are today. One is that the biomarkers have led to diagnostic tests, which I think is really going to change not only clinical care, the, flow, the work stream of the doctor and somebody who comes in with memory loss, but also prevention because these tests are, are inexpensive enough, especially the finger prick test that we were talking about earlier, to make widespread screening in the community of economically viable. And I, and I think also it's clear that the biomarkers have changed as um, clinical trial entry and, and monitoring. Um, and I would say, pro I would predict markedly reduce the cost and the time it takes to do um, clinical trials because we know that the average, for example, phase three clinical trial in Alzheimer's costs somewhere between three and $400 million. And half that cost is just finding the patients. And right now, companies are forced to screen with uh, PET amyloid imaging tests, which uh, we helped to bring, we helped to develop back about 25 years ago. Um, and that test currently on the market is $8,000, where the blood test could be, you know, down in a few hundred mm -hmm. dollars. So I think it's a big sea change in, in both clinical care and research that the biomarkers in amyloid have had. And it just illustrates where we're going next as we go into other targets and domains of treatment. Jeff, uh, building on that, what context of use would you want to see prioritized? Right. Um, so we've been working on context of use recently to try to understand this better. And I think the big gap that we have, and Henrik, I'm hoping you're going to solve this. So uh, this is an, a kind of an assignment, if possible, uh, is in target engagement biomarkers. Nearly all of our biomarkers are about the disease, amyloid, tau, neuroinflammation, neurodegeneration. They're not about is the drug hitting its target so that we could expect it reasonably to have an effect on tau or amyloid or neuroinflammation. So there's an intermediate biomarker that is really important for us to develop because if a drug doesn't have target engagement, we should stop it right then, right? We should stop it right then. Uh, and we don't have very many of these target engagement biomarkers. For me, they're the, they're the least development, developed of the repertoire of biomarkers that we have available that have been so fantastic, and, and largely from your work, Henrik. Thank, you thank you for that. But I think there is a missing component, which is the target engagement biomarker. Well, thank you for highlighting that unmet need. Uh, Rhoda, I'm going to come to you. I know you'll take offense to the fact that a biomarker has to be biological, yeah. has to come from a tissue or a cell. or Why, why is that? Why do you take offense to that? So, so I try to think of things um, from a much more global perspective. So when we talk about we're going to bring this into the primary care system, Right, and we're going to use this as sort of the first uh, line um, of detection. It's not going to be possible everywhere. 
So if we think about sort of healthcare availability, and particularly in this, in this area, right? So um, there are lots of parts of the world where this is a, a growing epidemic and they don't have that kind of infrastructure. So for me, if we're really thinking about bringing it truly to the person, right, to the individual anywhere, I think we have to rethink how we're gonna do that. And for me, that's why I, um, I think that digital provides that promise. I think that you can do it at your home, you can do it uh, if you need it administered, so you can do self-administered. But if you do need staff administered, it, could, it does not have to be someone with a lot of expertise. Because it turns out there aren't a lot of people with this kind of expertise when you start to think worldwide. And that's why I think about digital as sort of being that first line in which you can go get a signal and then you can sort of figure out what's the pathway. But I, I always sit there and think about not who we're including, but who we're not. And how do we reach them? Great point. And uh, before I come to you, Henrik, um, there was a conversation I was having around the time of the diagnostics exploit with a couple of folks. And they asked me, what do you want to do via the diagnostics accelerator? And I said, early detection. And they took offense to that mm. because to them, early detection was you pick up amyloid, you've detected the disease. So there is no concept of early detection. Then we squabbled over, okay, fine, maybe it's risk prediction. It's not early detection. The reason why I'm giving all of this is you wrote a paper saying it's not possible to detect the disease in plasma or blood 12 years ago or so. Uh, yeah, yeah. And you changed know. your mind. Yeah, so what context of use are you most <laughs> interested in? No, I, I, just to start with your comment, Jeff, that uh, this idea with um, uh, developing target engagement uh, biomarkers, I think it's super important. And that is something one should, that work should start whenever you have uh, an idea of uh, um, a pathogenic pathway you would like to interfere with the, with the compound already in the cell experiments or animal model experiments. So start to think about what could be the translatable target engagement uh, biomarker because um, I mean, most likely those, the, the cells you treat in preclinical studies and the, the animals you might treat, they, they will, th there will be changes happening in the biofluids and or in uh, imaging measures that you potentially could detect. And then that could be your translatable biomarker. And it could be drug specific. It could be really specific to your drug. So it, it, this would be an iterative process happening over and over when you think about what type of compound you are, you are trying to develop and examine. Uh, but I think it's a little bit easier to do that this now also with the refined technologies. And we talked earlier today about um, uh, more explorative approaches that could be generic for your biomarker, your specific biomarker discovery project to find your target engagement biomarkers that then uh, hopefully will be translatable. Um, and then Rhoda and I have discussed a lot about our uh, interactions now also. So I still think, Rhoda, that you are, you are measuring something else than a biomarker. But it's good and super important because the fluid-based and imaging biomarkers for tissue changes, they actually mean nothing in the absence of the information you will gather through testing brain function. And if one could do this um, uh, and combine these types of um, information, then you will be able to stage your patients. And then you could select them for the optimal treatment. Mm -hmm. So, it's, um, so I, I think we, it's very complementary, mm. uh, these approaches. And actually, not even complementary, they are essential, both of right. them. <gasps> And my favorite context of use, Yeah, I think uh, I one thing that would be really important and urgent to develop now is a predictive biomarker for dangerous area mm. Mm. and sure. also a diagnostic biomarker for dangerous area. Sure. I think that would, but that, that's sort of a low hanging fruit of immediate relevance now, because now we start to see that some, we, at least I've heard, you, you will know much more in the US about this, but there are ideas that one perhaps shouldn't treat right. APOE for homozygous people with the anti-amyloid antibodies. And uh, that feels, uh, it's a little bit heartbreaking for me because those are the ones who might be right. in the greatest need for the treatment. But if one could have 
some type of biomarker that tells you if you are at increased risk or not, independent of the EPO right. e genotype, that would be wonderful. Mia, when we talk about prevention and lifestyle modification, then we're not in the game of early detection. So what is the context of use that you are most interested in when it comes to lifestyle modification prevention studies? I would say they are in the same continuum in a way. So in the future, uh, we discussed this already earlier, the focus would be brain health. You should have the brain health checks. And then I think having biomarkers that you can check, not only amyloid tau, ATN, but also the other neuropathological features, Levy body and others. So that should be the goal that you have a possibility of checking what pathologies you have in your brain. Of course, I'm thinking the diagnosis is important and context of use, having now biomarkers which are validated that we can really find the pathology. But again, we should aim to have more biomarkers, not only ATN, which are validated in the, in the future. I would say prediction is the one where I'm still lacking, like you said, Henrik. Prediction is difficult, we all know, and earlier you start is even more difficult. We can predict on population level, but if you want to turn this to the individual, if you are working at the clinic, it's very difficult to take that data from the study. So here I think we should really have something for the future, try to have the prediction models. And here I was listening to you, think if we can combine blood and digital. It's not one biomarker, it's kind of the model when you put together, you, you get the kind of profile or risk score and then you can maybe have more data. Yeah. And this comes back to the big data. That's what I think we need if we want to move on with the prediction a more diversity in our data and sharing data that we can have. We can teach the models to be more, more kind of precise in the future. And, and you're getting at multimodal approaches to capture data uh, I see Susan here, I know. Um, there was an ambitious effort that uh, ARUK started. I still think there is there is a lot to be done on multimodal data capture because what is that composite signature? We don't know yet. Mm. What combinations of blood and digital, what aspects of digital, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so the challenge to the field maybe is to come up with a word or two words that don't include the word biomarker. Yeah. So we can truly then defend that it doesn't have to be a biological thing that you can measure. Non-invasive methods to measure biomarkers. Henrik, you might say that the lumbar puncture is just a back scratch or whatever. <laughs> but let's put that aside. Your most favorite non-invasive method to pick up biomarkers. Who wants to start? Most non -invasive. Go ahead. I just have a comment about... Um, you didn't uh, answer my question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, you can answer and then go on with your comment. Well, I don't, I don't want to steal... Um, Every, everyone can jump in with your favorite. Yeah. Well, I think one of the problems we have on our field is that to the physicians in particular don't view cognition as a bi biological process. It's kind of like if you're an internist, cognition is outside of your domain, or at least mm -hmm. historically it has been. And I think cognition is a biomarker. It's a product of the brain, which is you know an, an organ of the body. So I, I think I do think that digital biomarkers are, are biomarkers. They in fact are, and I think there's a, a reason to include them in that category. All right, so your favorite is digital cognitive tests. Well, it depends again. I think there's a difference between... <laughs> I, think I told a, you. Well, <laughs> when the doctor does a blood test, that's for diagnostic purposes. But for screening purposes, digital is cheaper and more widely available. So I think if, if, the, if the context of use is screening, then I think digital probably wins on criteria. Mm. But if the if the, but digital can't really give you, a, at least to, at this point, to my knowledge, digital doesn't give you a diagnosis with any certainty that it's Alzheimer's disease. I know we've seen companies that say that their digital profile yeah. can say there's amyloid in the brain, but I've yet to be convinced that that's possible, actually. But hold, hold your thought. I'll come back to you with a question there. Go ahead, Rhoda. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that the reason that the concept of a digital biomarker is something that we're still a little bit skeptical about is because we haven't had enough time. So I just kind of want to remind everybody, right, the blood-based biomarkers 10 years ago were not on people's radar, right? But it's sort of the thought. And once you have the thought 
And once you have the objective, then you start to work toward it. So I think that, first of all, I think that the concept of digital biomarkers is going to change. I don't think that the ones we think about right now are what's really going to end up that way. But I do think that um, it, it likely will be able to become predictive once we have enough data mm. to, to, to do that, right? Because digital is so new. So we haven't had the incubation time in a sense, right? We're starting to see that at Framingham. I work at the Framingham Heart Study because we started to collect digital voice in 2005. So we're starting now to try to build those predictive models because we have the data. And so I, 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 I would push back on this idea that a digital cannot be a biomarker. We just haven't gotten there yet. Go ahead, and just to add, I'm thinking just cognitive measure using more digital tools. There is yeah. so much there, but not so many are validated. So I agree yes. that the field yeah. is not yet there yeah. and there is this implementation gap. I'm very happy to work with Case Ventures and others with AD Riddle. That is a new initiative where we aim to validate both yes. digital biomarkers and blood and other fluid-based biomarkers. Yeah. And I think that's where we need to start. Think if you can use uh, cognitive testing much more often, maybe whole. I think that can help. You can get much more data there. Then you can scale it up with speech, maybe eye track. There are many other digital, which we don't know yet how well yes. they work. Yeah. And I'm also thinking um, monitoring, more passive monitoring, yeah. even back to the lifestyle factors, like sleep is sometimes difficult to measure how you sleep. But with the new sensors, you can collect much more data and use that also in the intervention. So yeah. I think there yeah. is a lot of things there. Uh, can I, uh, Jeff, I'll come to you. Sleep. Hmm. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence on sleep. What is it going to take to get definitive insights on quality of sleep, fragmentation of sleep, exactly. deep sleep, et cetera, et cetera? A lot. I mean, compared to other risk factors like blood pressure or body weight, sleep is so much more difficult. And normally we are collecting it. We are asking people, how did you sleep? How many hours? Of course, that's so different. Now we have, as said, in many studies, ways to measure that. But as you said, is it the duration? Is it how deep you sleep? I mean, there are maybe different needs. We are working now with WHO risk reduction guidelines during this year. So let's see what we will conclude. Yeah. And so so it's a great deal of interest, and I'll, I'll ask a rapid fire towards the end on those things. But Jeff, I'll come yeah. to you. Well, I, I wanted to put the, the digital biomarkers in context of use, because for me, they have a great application as monitoring right. biomarkers. So I don't really care whether they could tell me the difference between AD and frontotemporal dementia, I'm, but I would like to know a lot about wh how someone is progressing, whether there's a drug placebo difference in the way they are progressing. Sure. And I think it might be possible with a cell phone. Um, it, cell phone already tells me you know, how active I am with my step count. It could tell me how often I misdial uh, my passcode. Mm -hmm. uh, it could tell me uh, how often I make calls and maybe, maybe I'm getting more calls if I'm more active and, and less calls if I'm, if I'm less active. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can imagine a whole, yeah. a whole group of signals coming from my cell phone that would be complete, completely passive uh, and wouldn't require any kind of, yes. uh, of, of my doing something specifically and could be uh, uh, collected from a large number of people who agreed to have that have that uh, those data collected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Henrik? Yeah, um, I also I, I think what this is really, really important. And then the longitudinal aspect for the fluid and or imaging based biomarkers, but the fluid biomarkers in particular, there I think we need to figure out if there is more information in change, intra-individual change, than cross-sectional cut-point-based measures. Mm -hmm. So uh, th th there I think we need to do more studies to see if we could address this, preferably together with some type of digital uh, sure. assessment uh, tool, um, measured brain function. Um, uh, yeah. it, to me, it feels like it, it, it feels intuitively uh, reasonable that the change would be more informative than the 
cut point per se. And mm -hmm. perhaps then we can also uh, leave some of the confounding factors behind, because there are some confounding factors that influences the blood-based biomarkers. Not a lot if you compare with the Alzheimer and neurodegenerative pathophysiological processes in the brain, but uh, the, there are confounds that perhaps uh, the longitudinal assessment will help us deal with. And, and I think a few days ago I heard you say maybe P tau two seventeen in plasma is an amyloid tracer. Yeah. So are we truly looking for for diagnosis? The amyloid correlate that is definitive. Just like you said, digital cognitive tests. If they don't show the correlation, people don't take it seriously. Is that considered the gold standard? I think it's approaching that now in regards to amyloid pathology. So when amyloid uh, clamps form, surrounding neurons will react no, possibly for via for diagnosis as a context of use. Yeah, diagnosis, by phosphorylating yeah. and secreting tau. And then the degree of increase could potentially uh, reflect the number of neurons affected. But this is speculative for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and then that gives you a little bit of in intensity uh, marker in regards to the neural reaction to, to the amyloid. But of course, there are many, many other processes so, playing in there. So this brings me to where, in a place where if P217 truly becomes that correlate, everyone's betting on that, right? amyloid, PET correlate, then we don't need to do PET imaging. Mm. Everything else can be bridged to PTAU 217, mm. digital cognitive tests or driving test or an ocular test. Is that a fair statement or an exaggeration? I, th I think we are getting there, actually. <laughs> so if I was very cautious 12 years ago, now I am <laughs> perhaps on the other side. Perhaps that's aging. Uh, it's, um, um, I, I think for the amyloid component of Alzheimer's disease, this could potentially be right. But we don't get any anatomic information. That is a bad thing with the fluid-based biomarkers. And I'm also thinking the correlation between amyloid and cognition is oh. not perfect. So we still need to oh. have a measure for how brain functions because there may be more cognitive reserve. There may be other things happening there. Mm. So that is one, I would say. And also what we have now learned, we have been doing some uh, studies with proteomics and other biomarkers, even within the same patient groups, you have Alzheimer's diagnosis, amyloid tau. There are so many differences. Some may have more inflammation, others may have more oxidative stress. So there may be these subtypes beyond. So again, I'm thinking we should still move on. Maybe this is good enough for amyloid, I don't know, but, uh, but just not to stop the research there. But I would also cautious against, I mean, when we look at uh, clinically uh, the CSF biomarker pattern, then we look at four or five markers. And the pattern makes it much easier to write the statement uh, that goes back to the clinician seeing the patient. If total tau, phospho tau are up and a beta 42 fort ratio down, then it is a very, it's a quite solid indication that there is Alzheimer yeah. pathophysiology ongoing. But a single measure is always uh, dangerous. Mm -hmm. And we need to think about phospho tau, not as a biomarker for Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. but as a a diagnostic biomarker for Alzheimer's disease, but as a clinical chemistry test indicating a brain change. And then one has to remember that it's the clinician making the diagnosis, putting all the, the pieces together from family history, the patient's clinical history, all the other diseases the patient might have, a, a lot of other things. So it's. Um, so I, I would like to think about these blood-based biomarkers. That we should think about them much like the cardiologist is using the, the heart enzymes and uh, structural heart proteins. Uh, the hepatologist is using liver enzymes, and then we have a lot of. When we are uncertain, then we either invite the patient back and tell the patient that we are uncertain, or we do additional measurements and then we could go from blood and okay in this case I would like to do a CSF or an amyloid pet or something else. And these I think these these um, 
applications of PTAO 217 might also vary by context of use. Oh, right. So that so that yeah. diagnosis looks increasingly good, doesn't it? That looks quite strong in terms of the correlation. If you're thinking about, well, I'm going to stop my amyloid therapy when I get down to a specific threshold, I think 217 is far weaker oh. in determining that threshold. Is that is that true? Yeah, and I think actually this uh, points towards the whole discussion this morning, how big is the effect of the anti-amyloid treatments? So if we look at the phosphotau concentration change by anti-amyloid treatment, the reduction is 30 to 40 percent uh, after 6 to 12 months of treatment, and then not much more happens. And that, that's a little bit, it resonates with this 30 percent slowing of the disease. There are, there is still a neuronal impairment ongoing. It indicates that the anti-amyloid antibody didn't solve the problem for the neurons since phosphotau. When amyloid products form, phosphotau increases two, three, four, five, six-fold. And this 30% reduction, is not, it's yeah. not that good, actually. Yeah. So, but I don't think that's the biomarker's fault. Now I, <laughs> I, I, I defend the biomarker. I think it's the, bio, the pathophysiology. Yeah. There is still ongoing tau pathophysiology in the presence of um, anti-amyloid antibody when the patient by amyloid PET yeah. is negative. And that could indicate two, uh, could indicate more things. Either it is like the, the, this, that we are looking at an a beta triggered, but a beta independent tau pathophysiology. That's a little bit scary if that's the case. It could also mean that the treatment, there is still some amyloid floating around, uh, yeah. impairing the, the neurons via microglia and astrocytes or, or something else. So it's, um, that, that result really, I, I think it makes sense from the standpoint of what we, that the patients still progress, but at a yeah. slower rate. Mm. So we need to do more. Mm. Sure. You had your hand up, Rhoda. Yeah, I mean, I was gonna, I was just gonna say, in terms of PTAO uh, 217, I really think it's where along the continuum that you're actually looking at. So if we're talking about sort of the brain check prevention piece of it, because this is multi-etiological, right, and we know that there are probably some triggers that will lead to this accumulation of of amyloid. So for instance, now we think about vascular or inflammation, et cetera. So suddenly it becomes where along this insidious onset process are you really trying to pick up? And so I think there's a time and place yeah. for PTAO 217, but there's going to be precursor biomarkers, right? So that's my rapid fire. Thank you for setting me up. Oh, great. I'm going to come to the audience <laughs> after this rapid fire. 30 seconds each. 30 seconds each. Um, two questions. P217 is a good blood-based diagnostic. Where, which modality or which analyte will be the next to come as a diagnostic test? And the second part is risk prediction. Let's go 15 years above, 20 years upstream. Where do we find the optimism? Which modality will likely get us that screening tool or risk prediction tool? Who wants to go first? 30 seconds. Well, I, I think we've got on the market already NFL and GFAP as as biomarkers that are, haven't been quite validated, but GFAP is a measure of astrocytic activity and inflammation, and NFL as a measure of disease uh, activity. Certainly in MS, it's a good predictor. Um, I think those two might be the next ones down the line in terms of blood biomarkers. And diagnostic. Different. Yes. Diagnostic and perhaps even in, in disease activity, although we need more research on, on doing that. And I, so I think that's, that's one thing. And then um, what was your second question? <laughs> uh, your 30 seconds is not. Oh, okay. <laughs> never mind. Uh, it was about um, risk prediction. Which modality? Just yeah. two words. I, th I think it's going to be in the digital because it's the most widely. Digital. All right. Yeah. Anyone else? Go ahead. 
So um, I'm uh, liking 243, tau 243, as a marker of neurofibrillary tangles, available only in the CSF now, uh, but some equivalent of, of that measure so that we could have a better um, plasma measure with pow tit. Tau PET, uh, I think, would be uh, would be the next thing that would be really useful and might might emerge. I think we're we're moving in the right direction. Right. I don't know how close close we are. The other is, I would agree with Howard. I think digital might be the best predictor if we're if, if we're if we're talking, you know, far in the future. And 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 digital is great, but we are we're using digital very broadly. Yeah. Yes. So and people interpreting digital to even mean electronic health records. But I'm going to come to the far side and see what are your thoughts. Um, so near term, if you ask me about digital, I think that the near term is digital voice. I think that um, most people speak. It's a cognitively complex task. And uh, it's easy to collect. And, uh, and so therefore, and, and we have data. We're, and we're accumulating data very quickly. So I think that the very first uh, digital biomarker potentially will be through digital voice. Now, I don't think in the long term that it's going to be one. So I think it's going to be multimodal. I think it's going to have to be passive. I want to get away from the concept of assessment, by the way, these static assessments, so that we are inferring uh, your cognitive capacity rather than testing it. Mm -hmm. And that's where we need to be in the future. Great. Henrik? Uh, short term, I'm really interested in the RT-quick based measures of alpha-synuclein pathology. So if you have alpha-synuclein alpha accumulating in labor bodies, which is common across neurodegenerative diseases and a key feature of Parkinson and of course Lewy body dementia, you can detect seeds of misfolded alpha-synuclein by spiking in recombinant alpha-synuclein in a lumbar CSF sample. So I can get back to the CSF. But there are some data indicating that this could work actually in saliva since alpha-synuclein pathology is part, uh, you find it in um, salivary glands, and you can also, according to some studies, see it in the skin. Mm. Uh, so it, uh, oh, it, to me, that sounds so much science fiction, but it really looks promising. But uh, the CSF test we know works across laboratories, yeah. and implementing that clinically, I, I think, would be a short-term um, thing to help with diagnosing one of the prominent pathologies. That Great. Mia? Uh, I think blood and digital are the ways to go, and for blood, having not only ATN, but say uh, inflammation, synaptic function, vascular, having some markers that we have the whole spectrum what we can make. That combined with, let's say, starting with some cognitive digital tests, which are easy to use, not only in the highly specialized memory clinics, but also in the primary care. Great. Well, thank you for oh, indulging. Can I just say one more thing? Go ahead. There is a wonderful study from Anja Schneider's group in, in uh, Germany, in Bonn, yeah. with EVs enriched from blood, where she, takes, she simply centrifuges the blood and collects the medium-sized EVs, lyses them and measures alpha-synuclein and TDP43. Hmm. And, and it seems to work. Um, and I know that she had to work with a lot of independent cohorts, blinded samples, and published just a few months ago in Nature Medicine, her, her team's work. And I thought that, I mean, that's really, if this holds mm. up, then we ha have alpha-synuclein and TDP43 already yeah. in blood tests. And yeah. perhaps one could do something with these blood drops. Exactly. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, do a fingerprint testing have whole blood living cells, vesicles, and dried plasma, potentially? Um, we'll go to the floor for any questions from the audience. Uh, the one thing that caught me by surprise is nobody mentioned ocular. Oh, yes. But let's Maybe. go to the floor. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, make the assumption that I know nothing about the work of all you doctors and scientists. But a question came out in my mind with respect to this symposium. If, for the sake of conversation, you can be alerted to the possibility of somebody at a later age suffering from Alzheimer's or dementia, what is the time frame between when you can see a biomarker that tells you that that person may or will have dementia or Alzheimer's and when he actually shows the symptoms of it? Mm. Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. I think this could be a rapid fire as well. Yeah. Go ahead and take your best shot. 
20 years. 20. Yeah, 15, 20, but again, individual level, very difficult to predict because there are people with amyloid um, who will never uh, develop demons. Any other takers? Well, I, I agree. It's, uh, if we go for a phosphatile biomarker, it's important to remember that in early stages, there is a statistically significant group level difference, but still quite a bit of overlap. But in the symptomatic stages, it, it, it starts to look uh, like it could ha help with diag diagnosis put in a complete clinical context. I, I guess the only thing I would say is right now we're using the 15, 20 year mark because that's where we can measure uh, some signal. And I think that if we could do better with our tools, and that's from the clinical standpoint, so that's where digital comes in, I think we might be able to push that, actually, to even earlier. So I, I always want to caution us that we tend to limit ourselves to what our tools allow us to do. And so, you know, we've seen the progression of our diagnosis as a disease, right? I mean, I'm, I'm old enough, so it went from moderate to mild to MCI, and now we're into even the pro, you know, preclinical. So I always think about, is asymptomatic really truly asymptomatic um, in the way that we define it now? Yeah. All right. Oh, there's two questions. Go ahead. You came first, I believe. Ah, thank you. So uh, fascinating, fascinating discussion. I want to drill down a little bit on these digital biomarkers, Rhoda. Um, <laughs> and... <laughs> really think about and, and the the generalizability of this. So you're a big proponent about the democratization of this biomarker collection mm -hmm. um, and the smartphone. I mean, we're now monitoring our sleep, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and largely ignore that information, but nevertheless. Um, <laughs> How you doing? Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> sleep deprived. Um, so the question I have for you is. Are you going to be able to develop a strategy that enables people to monitor their own biomarker mm -hmm. and progression of that? And they're embedded in that is you can do it yourself on a phone app that is easy to do, accessible, and you can now then access uh, data that set, tells you where you are. Right, so you really have democratized both the collection of data and, if you will, the communication of the impact of that data. Is that where you're going? Yeah, I think that that's the goal. I think the one thing that I would point out is, is that when we talk about sort of this multi-sensor data collection off of the smartphone, for instance, which is going to be our greatest source, right, in our interaction mm -hmm. with it, mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things that I would caution is that it, this idea that it's going to be any one pattern because it's not. And it's not gonna be like this signal versus this signal or this combination of signals, because it's gonna be very dynamic. So even as we do this longitudinally in the person, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. if we think about it, you just think about it, you know, your memory is better at certain parts of the day than it is in the other parts of the day. So we're talking about things that are fluctuating and they're also interacting. So how much you sleep is gonna impact, right? Some of the other pieces like your physical activity, what you eat, et cetera. So there's no, I think, when I think about this digital biomarker reality, it's like we have to reset our thinking when we think about a biomarker, because we think about it as something static, something consistent. So right? but I'm concerned about that because, you know, where's the intervention? Where's the change of behavior? Where's, where's the opportunity to intervene either oneself or, mm -hmm. and then come back and say, all right, did I, did I improve or did this actually uh, harm my performance, right? So, yeah, I, again, I, th I think that, well, so I'm gonna give sort of more of a clinical example, right? Because if we think about now, you know, how do we start to stage when did this first happen, right? So you come in for an intake. What's the first thing they ask you? They ask you, when did you notice symptoms? Right? And so the person will give you a set of examples. 
But those examples, first of all, like I forgot to pay my bills, you know, I, I um, got lost, you know, et cetera, they're not static. They're not always forgetting to pay their bills. They're not always static. Uh, they're always getting lost. If you ask their family member, they'll give you a different set of examples. And if you ask another one, they'll give you yet another. And so yet, when you put this all together, even though the information that's feeding in um, is different, depending on who you ask, when you ask, et cetera, and it's not even a static example. Nonetheless, when you start to put it all together, that pattern emerges. So across all this heterogeneity, you start to see this, cons you do see a consistent measure of change, but the way we're gonna measure that change is not with the methods we have now. This is where the advanced analytics comes in. This is where your data science AI, I would tell you that I'm very curious about where quantum computing is gonna take us. So we have to be thinking about the fact that if we bring in a much different dynamic uh, um, data source, right? We're going to have to change the way in which we analyze it and how we interpret it. And I think we can get to that uh, reality, which we can't imagine now, but I think that we will get there just like we didn't think blood-based biomarkers were going to be possible. Thank you. Yeah. Let's go to the Jenny floor again. Jenny Libyan, SUNY Downstate, Brooklyn, New York. Um, you mentioned ocular, but I was actually hoping to hear about olfaction, if anybody mm -hmm. sees um, as a test of function or a, of screening of olfactory biomarkers. We are actually conducting a trial, or in our clinic, we have been adding that test. I don't think the results are ready yet, but it's ongoing. And we also do the eye tracking. So we, we try to use, and the speech. Yeah. And this, I think, is fascinating if we try to take all the senses as yes. well as seeing how the data. Yes. So I don't have the results yet, but we'll be, we'll be coming in the future. And I, I want to sneak in a second question of, um, since Phospho taus seem to be uh, two, two of the biomarkers that have been talked about. Is there any looking at phosphorylation state or uh, at ratios in terms of um, progress um, to see response to treatment as sort of an intermediate biomarker? Yeah, there is one specific way of measuring phosphotau that involves mass spectrometry, where you take the ratio of a triptic peptide incorporating phosphotau 217 with a non-phosphorylated uh, form. That ratio seems to be a little bit more stable across individuals, but it has, um, it's, a, it's dangerous if you have a very heterogeneous clinic where people might come in with other causes of neurodegeneration, for example, release of total tau from after strokes or so, then the ratio becomes wobbly. Um, so and in those contexts, it's better to measure the concentration of phosphor tau 217 in itself. So I, I often propose that if one has the ability uh, to report both, look at both the concentration and the ratio, but the, with the immunoassays, you can't get that ratio. Um, but but uh, it's definitely um, uh, one uh, possible way of um, measuring the phosphorylation state of tau. Mm. Thank you. All right, we'll take two more questions before we continue on. Go ahead. Hello, uh, I'm Sarah Garcia. I'm a neurologist at the cognitive unit here at Karolinska, and I'm also an assistant professor working with the Swedish Dementia Registry, mostly doing mm -hmm. uh, cohort studies and working with medication repurposing. Mm -hmm. So uh, just a thought experiment. Imagine we're in that phase two study that we talked today with a combination of treatments, and we want to test, but we of course don't have a million patients and every arm which biomarker would you guys use to see if, uh, to, to be the first outcome for your study? Hmm. It depends a bit on the mechanism of action of the drug. But, but you have two drugs. You have, okay. And they interact and they do different but things. But they are supposed then to slow down Alzheimer's. Yeah, they, they, they work. Let's assume they work, yes. Oh. I, I would pick uh, uh, either a synaptic marker like neurogranin or phosphotau 217, perhaps both. I was thinking phosphotau 217, yeah. yeah. Well, one, one thing I would say is a complexity of, of uh, combination therapy uh, is that you have to understand each drug itself. 
and I would say you, you would really want a biomarker for each agent. Uh, and then that would define part of your collection status for the trial. Uh, because we're, we're going to have to, to understand, well, is one drug just riding along and producing side effects, but it's not helping the patient? Or are both of them really contributing to the combination? Maybe not 50-50, but they're making some contribution to, the, to, 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 the, to assisting the patient. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll need to understand each drug separately, including their biomarker status. Target engagement for each drug separately. Yeah, I think That's so, yes. Thinking. But now I see what you are after also, because you have the Swedish Dementia Registry, mm -hmm. and in there we have just merged it with the uh, clinical neurochemistry database with That's thousands of thousands of thousands of CSF biomarker results. Yeah. And some have repeat. So, oh, yeah, I see what you can do now. You can look uh, what the patients, mm -hmm. what, uh, yeah. And you okay, this yeah. is wonderful. I, you could see mass of comorbidities and other medications yeah. as well. How that's, and that comes back to the, what biomarkers are relevant. Very interesting. I, th I think the answer to your question is also the, when I spoke about the two factorial buses, the four factorial t t study design, the, the ultimate answer to your question is really the four factorial to see in that trial how each drug works alone and then how they work together. And the FDA sort of, when we went to them about one of our repurposing agents, the FDA said you needed a four factorial, but the EMA said a two factorial where you just compare both drugs against placebo was okay. So there's a regulatory dissonance about the answer to your question, but I think scientifically, if you really want to know the answer, you have to do the four factorial. But I mean, what you could do now, you could really look for, you could use all the data you have there and ask, is there any drug or drug combination which is associated with a lower CSF phosphata 181 concentration? Because that's, what, that's the biomarker you will have the most readouts on, so it's a bit opportunistic here. Or associated with a uh, uh, higher than expected EBITDA 42-40 ratio. Exactly. Yes, thank you. Right. Thank you. Let's go to the left. Thank you. Francesca Mangialaski. I work at Karoliska Institute and the Fiegler Brain Health Institute. I think my question is very much uh, consistent with also what Sarah asked. Um, thank you for the fantastic conversation. What I mostly heard is biomarkers of risk. Given the positive outlook on treatment prevention, how about predictor of intervention response? So when we have an individualization of something that can benefit, we are able to understand if drug A, drug B, or lifestyle plus drug can say something, and it can be anything. The easiest example is the APOE4 that we have studied in books as the risk factor for dementia, but now we know from finger and other studies, like the Japanese finger-like study, that APOE4 benefit more. So that can also be used to predict intervention response, but could be anything else. I would like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I can maybe start. Thank you, Francesca, for, for, for this very good question. Yes, biomarkers could and should definitely be used as a predictors. And it can be, as I said, the response and also see who are the responders and non-responders. And I'm so happy and excited now, Henrik, because now for the first time, we will have in the finger all these lovely biomarkers from Henrik at baseline after two years and after 11 years, thanks for the support from ADDF. So we can study the responders, non-responders, short-term, and long term, and not only amyloid and tau, but Henrik, you can tell more how many biomarkers you are analyzing. Yeah, we are doing this <laughs> Alamanulisa panel, 120 CNS related proteins, including the established biomarkers, uh, but also markers related to um, uh, microglial activation, astrocytic activation, uh, and so in blood. And there is one mi marker that I just would like to mention, which uh, has. Um, it, I, Microglia, they are so much like macrophages, of course. In the blood, the macroglia-related proteins are most often reflecting macrophage peripheral release. But there is one protein which looks super interesting mm -hmm. in studies where we have had access to amyloid PET, tau PET, and TSPO PET, and it's called FABP3. We thought for a long time that that was a neuronal injury marker, but that's really a microglial protein, we and need, that can yeah. be measured. 
this and that could be the way to find the window of opportunity. Like if you have like amyloid and tau in your brain, is the finger intervention more or less effective? So I think that is nice. One more thing for the biomarker part, what I think will be exciting, and this is a bit back what you said earlier, what are the mechanisms? So for example, the multi-domain intervention, what are the underlying mechanisms? So these biomarkers can also ask partly for that question, and that can help to find novel targets for new interventions. And I, th I think one other really, really interesting example of the predictive biomarker was, is the denanumab study, well, where everybody had amyloid, so there was uh, so there was one target, right? And then the Lilly's wager was if they had too much tau, they wouldn't respond. So it was a predictive biomarker of non-response, and that turned out to be true, mm. right? The, the 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 response was seen in the low to moderate uh, uh, tau group, but but not in the high tau group. Uh, so, so that's an exa one example of looking at co-pathology as a way of predicting the non-response to the drug. <laughs> not quite what yeah. you ask, but relevant to, the, to what you ask. Yeah, the one thing I didn't do a good job of is this position aspect of the panel and the topic, but I think this has been a great discussion. I want to come in the last two minutes, the last rapid fire. If you had a magic wand, and you could have one wish that came true vis-a-vis -vis biomarkers for Alzheimer's and related dementias or to enable precision prevention, what would that be? I'll start. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Rapid transition to clinical care. I think it's a hurdle and I want people to benefit from all of the work that's being done. Yeah, in light of wait times, like six months and eight months, even now. Right. I would, actually, I would agree with that. I think that's the greatest need right now. It's, it's, somebody has just wasted a magic wand. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it's the same for me. We are very homogeneous partners. <laughs> it's the implementation gap, preaching that, and giving maybe more hope for the communication that this is something for the brain health. You can find if you have some, you, if you are at risk. So maybe also turning the discussion away only on Alzheimer's and more for finding if you are at risk. Yeah, I actually would want that um, smartphone application that I think Ravi was um, referring to, which is as you go through your natural course of your life and as you're interacting with your environment, whether on the phone or it could be elsewhere because we have other smart devices, that you can get that uh, signal, you can get the, um, the alert yep. that, um, that something may be going on to trigger. So I think about how genetics, right, um, when you, we brought it to the consumer, how much they were now able to take information to their doctor as a way to really push things forward. I think that this is the way that we're going to get the brain health mm -hmm. to actually move forward, mm -hmm. is that people can take their brain health information to their physician. And Rick? No, and I want a biomar an established biomarker panel for TDP43. I think that will be extremely informative. Um, there are candidates that look promising from, from other research groups, but uh, nailing it would be wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you for indulging in this format and the questions. We thought the work of the Diagnostics Accelerator is done, and I keep telling everybody that our job is done, but clearly <laughs> you're asking us to do more. So, Mark, good luck. Uh, with that, I want to thank you all for your time and attention and all the questions from the floor. Let's give our panelists a warm round of applause. Thank you. Very good.